Welcome back to The Horse Race, your weekly look at politics, policy, and elections in Massachusetts. I'm Steve Pizzella, president of the Massing Polling Group. And I'm Jennifer Smith. And hey, all you cool cats and kittens, this is Stephanie Murray, author of the Politico of Massachusetts Playbook, and now a huge Tiger King fan. Uh, we are in a whole new world here, a world of video and Zoom podcasting. So if you're listening to this later, we're actually recording the horse race as a video this week. We're trying something new. That's right. If you're listening to it on SoundCloud, this, uh, this is also available on video. Um, of course, seasons one and two will soon be available to you on Netflix. But for now, <laughs> wherever this video lives, we hope you'll come and watch it. I do feel like I kind of spend all my time on Zoom now. Like I was already doing all of my meetings on Zoom and now podcasting is also being done on Zoom. Yeah, Steve, what, where are you actually right now? It looks like you're in the great outdoors about to topple off of someone's roof. That would be nice. I do wish that I was, but this is also just the magic of Zoom. Uh, I'm, it, it's Suffolk Downs. Don't you recognize Suffolk Downs? Suffolk Downs, the host of our live podcast. That's what's in the background. But yeah, actually, well, I'm sitting in my spare it, room, I'm not actually at Suffolk Downs. Yeah, well, Suffolk Downs, not only the spot of our first, uh, or not our first, but just that really excellent live podcast with the really excellent hats, which we should be wearing today, and I'm a little upset that we aren't, to be honest, but it's also uh, the first responders COVID testing facility, so we have both the horse race connection and also the uh, coronavirus connection, so synergy. Yeah, that's, that's a little dark, Jen. Thanks for sort of dragging that one down. Um, but no, seriously, we are here. Today is, it is April 1st, so uh, there's a lot, going, a lot going on in terms of the response to, to coronavirus. Um, Suffolk Downs is playing a role, but there's, there's also just a lot going, going on all around Boston and all around the state. So um, first, I think it's probably helpful just because it sets some context as far as what we're going to be discussing to just talk about what kinds of advisories and what kinds of rules we're living, on, living under right now, um, just because it seems like it changes almost on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, everyone's adjusting right now to working online because we're still under this stay at home advisory, but not order, which is a little bit weird, which does mean that Stephanie was on a really fantastic conference call the other day that we have some audio from. It was a small business owner and congressional reps uh, conference call that went a little haywire. So what did that sound like? Uh, so before I roll the tape, I just want to say that even though this has been a weird few weeks, um, working from home and working primarily online can be very funny when there are technical difficulties. So I was sitting on this call. We were in a Zoom call, but there were too many people. So we got kind of bumped into uh, a separate Zoom call where nobody was muted and nobody knew what was going on. And we were all waiting for 20 minutes for this call to start. It never did. And this is a, so this was about 20, 25 minutes in. Here's what people were saying. I'm pouring my second glass of wine. I think we all recognize the end. That, that's a very familiar feeling when you've been sitting on a Zoom call, even one that's actually started for 20 minutes. It's like, can I pour a glass of wine without anybody seeing me? <laughs> no, it's true. Let me let me tell you that's also the uh, the reaction or feeling after I suspect other people who are in my situation of being on hours and hours of online classes. Mm. By the end of the afternoon, let me tell you, everyone's starting to look to the side and contemplate their bar carts in it. I mean, it's it's rough. Well, Jen, yeah. your your bar cart looks looks kind of nice behind you. It's making me putting me in the mood for a glass of wine, even though it's one forty five p.m. I don't even think time really matters at this point. Like it's just a long continuum where you could probably drink wine for wherever you want. But on a more more serious note, where we're at right now <laughs> is that we have a stay at home advisory, not a stay at home order like some other states have. Um, and I mean. This, to me, it's been kind of creating some confusion. I still see people out at the basketball courts by my house, um, not really honoring the social distancing rules. Yeah, well, we, uh, I mean, it, it's one of the things that's been kind of confusing as well, uh, where near me over by um, Savin Hill, there are a bunch of basketball courts. And just last week, they were pretty much packed full of people. And so since then, the city of Boston, who, again, is saying, please don't do contact sports because 
this is a really contagious disease that you can pass along to people through contact, they're, they've started zip tying the basketball hoops shut to discourage people. So you're in Medford, Stephanie, are they doing that? Um, so what we have in Medford, at least near where I live, is the basketball court is kind of roped off with this big cross of caution tape on all of the entrances. And so what that's doing is uh, now everybody who wants to get on the basketball court who was using it before is still doing it, but now they're just all touching the same caution tape. So I think it's uh, what they're sweating. Yikes. So I think it might be kind of beside the point. Uh, but school's out until May 4th, so kids are around. Um, Non-essential businesses are closed until then now too. Liquor stores are considered an essential business, but recreational marijuana dispensaries aren't, which is creating some tension in the state. Uh, and out-of-state visitors are being asked to either not come here at all or to just self-quarantine for a full 14 days. And you can see that when you're driving on the highway, um, on roadside signs, they're handing stuff out at Logan Airport, at the rest stops. Um, so things have really just changed so dramatically here, even though there could be some more regulation or more rules put in place as this virus continues to spread. Yeah, this, yeah, week, was, this week was the one where I think we and, and everybody really sort of got the sense that this is not something that's going to be over anytime soon and, and <clears throat> started to, we're starting to at least hear, hear dates. Um, you know, when, when that, that are a little bit further into the future, you know, it, it started off like early April just to kind of get things rolling. Um, but, but now even here in Massachusetts, we're looking at, at early May at the earliest. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, based on what we're hearing about when the peak might happen in terms of uh, the medical issues, that, that could be early to mid April. So if, if things, if there's still tons of hospitalizations and, you know, the infection is still spreading in early May, you know, we'll, we'll just have to keep an eye out and uh, listen to the briefings and see if that those dates get moved back even further. Um, but if, but for now, it's it's May fourth. Everything's closed. Non-essential businesses are closed, um, and pretty much the states. I, I think the best uh, expression I've heard was in a um, interview Commonwealth did. We've kind of put the economy into a medi medically induced coma. You know, we've just stopped it. We're waiting. And everything's shut down. Everybody's kind of waiting to see what to, to see. Um, but May 4th is the date that we have at the moment. Yeah, well, I mean, speaking of all of those briefings, Stephanie, you basically have to have to live on a briefing at the at these points. I mean, there's there's a lot of drama, obviously, right now between Governor Baker and the federal government, um, uh, where the White House keeps outbidding Massachusetts over PPE. So what's going on there? That's right, Jen. And there are so many briefings and updates and press conferences that it's almost hard to keep up even working from home. And I've kind of become the de facto briefing newswire for my friends and family who are like, when is Governor Baker going to be on TV? What time is the Donald Trump going to be on? When should I tune in? Uh, and so I think that speaks to how everybody's home. Everybody's really interested. So right now, it seems like Charlie Baker, a couple of weeks ago now, voiced his concerns to Trump that the state was getting outbid on PPE and Trump on that call uh, said that he heard him and things would change. And then a week later, it seems like they didn't and Baker got kind of animated during a press conference. He almost uh, said a curse word, it starts with God, ends with uh, something else. I don't think we're allowed to swear on this show. Um, Are we but... still a family podcast? <laughs> <laughs> we should just clarify quickly, PPE, of course, is personal protective equipment and refers to things like masks and gowns and all of the stuff that, that uh, medical providers have been trying to get, which has been an incredibly short supply. Um, and all the states are kind of scrambling both to get their own and in many cases battling one another, not battling, but just competing with one another and competing with the federal government to try to get what they need. That's right. And right. Massachusetts seems like it really needs to get that equipment because, uh, I mean, even yesterday, Massachusetts and Boston got a shout out during the White House press briefing as kind of trouble spots, spots that are showing troubling signs of trending more like New York City, where the outbreak has been really large and less like California, where uh, those stay at home measures that they did early were able to kind of flatten the curve and spread out the rate of infection over a longer time and have to have fewer people infected at the same time. So there's still time to change all of that, but hospitals, the governor, everybody's saying getting this equipment, the masks, the gloves, the gowns is gonna be crucial to protecting people on the front lines like healthcare workers. 
Yeah, and it's starting to look really intense, too, just kind of even watching from the outside. The DCU Center is turned into a field hospital set up by the National Guard. Uh, I think this is one of the one of the reasons, too, why I personally, as just someone that has to, you know, live in Massachusetts, like, I appreciate the, the constant updates as far as the uh, press conferences coming from all municipal and state and federal levels, but it does just kind of feel like a deluge and it's hard to pick through exactly what's important. So, so I expect that's a pretty widespread thing uh, for everyone that's not just calling Stephanie every hour of the day to ask what matters. But speaking of time being a flat circle, meaningless, which is normal, but even more so now, uh, why are we here today, Steve? Yeah, so today we have a couple things to talk about. <clears throat> today we have a couple things to talk about. One is that um, in addition to all the elections that have been po postponed for various reasons, uh, there's been some action as far as the Democratic uh, convention this summer, specifically the Massachusetts Democratic Convention, and that has implications for the, for the Senate race. And then we've been doing a lot of polling on how Massachusetts residents are reacting to and adjusting to uh, the coronavirus outbreak. So uh, we'll be talking about that in some detail because I think that now that we're all kind of home and isolated and so forth um, and, and are for the most part taking the public health measures we're supposed to be taking, the economic catastrophe that's slow rolling across Massachusetts is is really the, the thing that I think will, will define the next few weeks. So we'll be, we have a lot of numbers to talk about there too. So, shall we do it? Yeah, all right, let's go. So we've talked a lot already about the problems that the pandemic has caused for democracy. So far, it's mostly meant delayed primaries here, but conventions are also on the chopping block right now. And so chairman of the Democratic Party, Gus Bickford, here in Massachusetts, announced this week that the Democratic State Convention has also been canceled. Uh, Stephanie, our beloved horse race special convention cancellation correspondent. <laughs> what does that mean? What are the actual practical implications of this? Okay, so what this means is that the big state democratic convention that was supposed to happen in Lowell on May 30th uh, is probably not going to happen anymore. The state party is going to have a virtual vote on Saturday the 4th to uh, technically cancel it, but pretty much everybody agrees they can't go forward with what is happening now. So if you still haven't gotten your hotel deposit back for the convention, now is definitely the time to do so. It's not happening. Well, right. usually and when we hear the convention, we're, we're thinking of the national conventions, the National Republican Convention and Democratic Convention, where they formally nominate the, the presidential uh, not nominee for each party. Um, for those that don't follow the ins and outs of party conventions and caucuses here in Massachusetts, what actually happens at the Democratic Convention? Why is it important? And what are the implications of it being canceled? So the way that it's different in Massachusetts than at the National Convention is that the party at the convention in the state doesn't nominate somebody the way that they do nationally. Instead, delegates vote uh, to decide who's going to be on the primary ballot. So to get on the ballot, you have to crack 15% of the vote among the elected delegates who vote at the convention. And then whoever gets more votes from the delegates is considered endorsed by the convention, which is not the same as being endorsed by the party. The party does not endorse, the convention endorses. And so over the past several weeks, from February to March, uh, caucuses were happening in local towns and city ward committees. Um, and those were, you might have seen on Twitter, it's kind of an insidery thing, but both the Kennedy and Markey campaign were trying to get delegates who supported them to be elected so that they would go on to the convention and vote for them. Uh, but now that's all called off. Right. The convention endorsement, the way that this is rolled out, it effectively handed it over to Senator Ed Markey. Uh, so that decision still has to be approved by the full state committee in April. But but it is like an unusual, unprecedented kind of thing here. So how did that actually roll out? How did the campaigns respond? It really is totally unusual and kind of unexpected. But the way that it happened was that both campaigns were on a phone call with Gus Bickford or a series of phone calls. They had been in touch with the party chair talking about what they were going to do, how to move forward. And the agreement that they came to privately was that Ed Markey would be considered the winner of the convention, the convention would be called off, and Joe Kennedy would be considered to have met or surpassed that 15% delegate threshold, so he'd be able to get on the ballot too. 
And the reason that they decided to call off the convention instead of doing, uh, they were looking at a vote by mail convention where they would have to have the delegates send in, get ballots in the mail and then send them back. But it seemed like that would kind of push things up uh, too close to the Secretary of State's June deadline to even get the ballots printed. And they would have had to finish the rest of the caucuses that were supposed to happen but got called off because of coronavirus concerns in, in the middle in the middle of March. So they would have had to do vote by mail for that too. They talked briefly about virtual caucuses, um, but I think what happened in Iowa scared people also. Um, it's just, it was a logistical nightmare. And so this was the agreement that all the camp, that both campaigns and the party came to. Certainly, you know, it seems like it makes sense from the perspective of just keep, A, keeping people apart and B, as you said, reducing some of the chaos that other, uh, we've seen in other processes sort of over the last few months. Um, I'm curious specifically though about, the, the, there's one detail of the agreement that just sticks out like a sore thumb, soft, sore thumb, of course, and that's just deciding that Ed Markey was the winner of the convention. What was that based on? And, you know, well, how's the Kennedy campaign been reacting to it? So this is kind of an interesting wrinkle in the Senate race that was just bizarre, or I don't, I don't know if bizarre was the right word, um, but unexpected to begin with that a member of the delegation would primary uh, a sitting senator. Now it's even more unusual. So basically, the way that they came to this decision was Margie had more delegates who supported him who had been elected at the 70 or so percent of caucuses that were already done. Um, and he had, I'm not sure the exact numbers, but he had more delegates than Kennedy. So it was presumed that if they went to the convention and everybody voted, he would have been the winner. So that's how they got to that agreement. But there was uh, some, some bickering and some confusion. So there was one source who told me that it was the Kennedy campaign who suggested that Markey be the winner of the convention and Markey's campaign was reluctant to agree to cancel until everybody agreed that Markey would be considered the winner. But Markey's campaign pushed back on that really strongly. John Walsh's campaign manager said everything was led by Gus Bickford and that uh, he, the first person to say that Markey was going to win the convention was actually Joe Kennedy's campaign manager in February in a tweet when he said, you know, it's obvious that Markey's going to win the convention. Uh, we're just trying to make sure Joe gets on the ballot. So called up Guest Bickford, asked him who suggested what and how it went down. And he said, it's neither here nor there. We were just trying to get to X in the most positive way. So uh, it wasn't totally easy, it sounds like to me, but, you know, this is the decision they came to. Yeah, and and not to be that person too, but you know, when we talk about winning the the convention here, what impact does that actually have? Well, uh, Attorney General Maura Healy lost her convention, and now she's the Attorney General. Uh, Secretary of State Bill Galvin lost uh, his most recent convention, and he is the Secretary of State. Uh, and I mentioned both of those elected officials to say that winning the convention does not mean that you are going to win the primary. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, but it's not a strong indicator of whether you'll win. It's an indicator of who has kind of that activist and insidery party support, which is important for volunteers, for campaign mechanics, all of those things. And it's a good, it's a big win for Markey over Kennedy. You know, he's kind of, uh, he's in a tough position to have a primary challenge, especially during a pandemic. But it's kind of an insidery thing. People, the average voter isn't really paying attention to this. Uh, so two sides of a coin. It's also, you can't help thinking of it as perhaps foreshadowing what could happen to the national convention, you know, and I'm sure that the, I know that the media accounts have suggested that the national party is also contemplating what to do about their own convention. Um, so certainly interesting to see what's happening here in Massachusetts. I, I know there's been at least one debate between Kennedy and Markey. Overall, any other developments in the campaign or have things kind of just mostly been on hold as far as something the voter might notice? Uh, both campaigns are really getting uh, to be extremely online. Joe Kennedy has gone live on Facebook like dozens of times. He's gone live on Instagram with Beto O'Rourke. He has different guests joining him on what it seems like almost a nightly Facebook live broadcast. And so now Ed Markey has been starting to match that. He's done a couple of Facebook lives. Uh, and he also started a podcast called Markey on the Mic. So uh, both of these campaigns are kind of getting like a 21st century upgrade. You can't knock on doors. Um, so I guess you have to podcast. 
that's that's wow. why that's why we podcast. It's really just to make sure that we're competing with Ed Markey and his lane uh, as he campaigns for Senate right there. Isn't that right, Steve? Yeah, if we were less technologically sav savvy than the Ed Markey campaign, then we probably should cancel this podcast. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I will say one important thing to keep an eye on, especially as the FEC deadline comes up. Um, I think everybody has to report by April 15th, which is coming pretty soon. Joe Kennedy a few weeks ago suspended his campaign fundraising and he's been using his list to raise money for organizations like food banks and all sorts of stuff. Well, Ed Markey has been uh, still fundraising for his campaigns. So I'll be interested to see who raises more. Uh, you might remember last quarter, Joe Kennedy outraised Markey by about a million dollars. But since then, Markey's gotten a lot of activist support on Twitter. You know, he raised like 50 grand in a single day off of a viral tweet. So I'm really excited to see their campaign finance numbers. And now we have plenty of time to just look at them. That's right. And Steve, the answer to this one might be no, but is there any any polling that's looking at how the Marky Kennedy matchup is these days? Because we did see that really dramatic change from the initial polling uh, last year, and then suddenly it seemed like the race narrowed a lot. Uh, any sense of where we're at now? Yeah, there hasn't been anything public since then, at least. I mean, I think one of the things that 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 that, that second round of polling showed was that a lot of Democrats kind of figured out who Ed Markey was in some ways. You know, there was this sort of uh, mystery or mystery about Ed Markey for you know when he was first elected and for a long time after that. Not so much, I guess, a mystery, but more of just like an apathy. It's like, sure, he's fine. You know, he does. He, I don't really know much about him, but he, he seems okay. I don't really love him. I don't really hate him. Um, you know, in contrast to Elizabeth Warren, where there's just such strong polarized feelings about her. Um, but Ed Markey uh, never really generated those numbers until he had an opponent. And then a bunch of liberal Democrats and environmental Democrats and, you know, people who follow, uh, for example, there, there was the AOC endorsement, you know, people who listen to uh, things that she has to say and sort of are tuned into that network suddenly realized, you know, who Ed Markey is and that he that he's um, got this very long and liberal uh, voting record in, in first in Congress and now in the Senate um, and that that the original idea of the race, which is that you've got a young challenger challenging someone who's been there for a long time doesn't really conform to a lot of the other templates that people are trying to squeeze it into. So I think that's to, to a certain extent that kind of uh, gave people a reason to give Ed Markey a second look, and, and that, I think, is part of why the race tightened up. Right. All right. Well, I mean, I know Stephanie's going to be watching the FEC filings. We're all going to be watching all of the, uh, I assume, Beto and Joe live streams as they keep rolling through. <laughs> I think uh, we should go live. Don't you guys think we should do a live? I feel like we should go live after we find out if we've said anything really, really dumb and haven't noticed on this particular recorded stream. There's no like pedal style, like live streaming your dentist appointments or anything like that. No, no, <laughs> absolutely I'll just, I'll not. I'll come that, like stand outside your house and go live and you can like yell from the window or something. I mean, now we Please. have to do it. That might be a fun thing. <laughs> wait, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Yes, a boom box, but playing the Massachusetts State Polka. Yeah, oh, and I'll just have my phone. <laughs> this must happen. This must happen. Oh, All no. Right. But, <laughs> but we, we have other things to talk about today, aside from Lenny Gamolka and the Chicago push, right? Uh, surprisingly, we do. And so we're going to shift gears. In the absence of polling in the Kennedy Murphy race, we do have a lot of coronavirus polling to talk about here in Massachusetts. Uh, so Massachusetts residents are bracing for the economic reality to take a turn for the worst over the next several months. The state's unemployment system is just absolutely flooded with new claims and the stock market has taken a nosedive amid the coronavirus pandemic. Those economic disparities though are not the same across the board. They vary among different groups in the state's workforce. And so here to talk about it, we have Steve right here, the crown prince of COVID-19 polling, uh, our polling expert. So Steve, for people who are just tuning in who maybe didn't listen, last week. Could you give us a lowdown on this poll and how the tracking poll works and why it's different from other polls? Yeah, sure. So the tracking poll, what a tracking poll is, is a poll that's repeated in some form or fashion over time. So basically it's doing exactly what the word suggests, which is tracking to see whether opinions change or whether they stay the same. Um, and in a, it, it's particularly useful in a situation like this where opinion and action was changing day to day. You know, we talk about it in terms of what we're hearing at the briefings, but 
we also saw it show up in the data as far as how people were behaving and how people were reacting to reacting to uh, the crisis as it, as it was beginning to unfold. You know, huge changes in opinion, huge changes in how seriously people were taking it, the personal actions they were taking. I mean, you think back to even, you know, this only started just over two weeks ago as far as the, the stay, stay home advisory. Um, you know, three, four weeks ago, this wasn't on most people's minds in the same way that it is, it's certainly not in the same way that it is now, and in many cases, not at all. Um, so a tracking poll in situations like this can be very useful just to see sort of how, the, how things are unfolding and, and uh, what people are hearing and what people are doing. Right, so actually break down what that jump looks like to us. So has there been an increase over the past few weeks about how seriously people are taking the virus itself and understanding what they're supposed to be doing to deal with it? Yeah, so, and that, that's a good question. This polling goes back to Mar March 16th, um, and we're still doing it. We're still in the field through this Sunday. Um, but, but, so these numbers probably would have moved even more if we'd been polling sort of back to the beginning of March before people were um, kind of really looking at really looking at this issue at all. Um, but but just for example, we asked how serious people think how serious of a threat people think coronavirus poses to each of the following, and we asked about people across the state, people in your city or town, you personally, and elderly people. And in each case, we saw the numbers increase as far as the, the percent who see it as very serious or the percent who see it as at least somewhat serious. Um, so the, the number who see it as a, as a uh, very serious threat to you personally has gone from 41 to 48 percent um, just in the course of a couple weeks. If you, the same, you see the same kind of jump when you're looking at you know just the total total assessment of whether people think uh, people think that it's serious at all we also see huge changes in behavior um, over that time so we asked for instance uh, about how, what's how are you approaching this in terms of visiting people um, and the number who say they they are not seeing or visiting anybody nobody at all has gone from 46 percent uh, in mid-march to 63 percent today so 17 point jump just in the course of about you know 10 or 12 days a bit you said about people of different ages um, interested me. I know we all saw those photos of people in Southie partying before St. Patrick's Day, uh, where all the young people were out. Steve, is there an age group that took longer, according to this poll, whether it's the elderly who maybe didn't take the virus as seriously at first, or young people? Is there a group that kind of dropped off or didn't take it seriously as soon as other age groups? Yeah, I mean, people have, have understood that this that this is a, a serious concern for el the elderly. Almost, they understood that pretty much right away, um, almost universally, which is another really interesting aspect of this is just the speed at which we got from this is something no one's ever heard of. The word coronavirus wasn't even something anybody knew to, you know, March 16th, we already have 96% realizing that this is a serious threat to elderly people. Um, you know, just universal awareness of, uh, of the threat that it poses. And I think at this point, we do have a, a pretty, uh, pretty even distribution of, of the actions that people are taking. Um, there's certainly awareness of where the threat is greatest, but, but people are kind of on board with the, with the things that they need to be doing um, sort of across age groups. The thing that, that's not necessarily equal across age groups is what the actual impacts are. Um, so, uh, you know, young people are, are taking more of the economic, more of an economic hit to be honest. Um, there's a few reasons for that. Some is just the nature of the, the different jobs people have. Uh, you know, if you can work remotely, if you're, if you're um, a salaried employee, <clears throat> if you're a full-time employee, all of those things make you much more likely to, have, to be sort of secure in, in the job that you have. If you're part-time, if you're lower income, if you're paid by the hour um, and you're not working remotely, all of those things mean you, you're likely to have either lost a job or lost a significant portion of your paycheck already. Right. Well, actually, to that point, I was I was struck by uh, that one in four residents said they'll face serious financial hardship within a month and another 15 percent anticipated issues the month after that. Does that seem I, I mean, maybe it's just me that actually kind of surprised me. It felt low almost the idea of of just kind of being cut off from from work in that way. Does it mean that more people have mobile jobs? Than, than maybe we realized? 
Does it yeah, say I mean, something about kind of the nature of work and that it's mostly the folks that are stuck in kind of this essential services territory that are really both worst impacted but also are likely to stay impacted? Yeah, I think we are learning something during the course of this about how much can actually be done remotely. Um, you know, more people I think are, are at least pushing the limits of what their employer probably used to think they could do remotely. Um, but the, the question of, of whether, of um, sort of whether that's a high enough number for, for who will be suffering financially, 16% um, of respondents in our poll said they lost a job, which first of all is just a staggering number. Like that's an enormous number of people. Yeah. Um, and that's held steady over the two ways where we asked that. But it also means, you know, when you're looking at the number who will suffer major financial problems in the next month, it means 84% of people who had a job still have a job. So um, some of those people now have lost some wages or lost some portion of the paycheck, uh, particularly hourly workers, um, but, but they're not completely out of work. So they're, they're, uh, what the poll suggests is that there's many who are um, able to, to put together some kind of um, acceptable situation at least for the next couple of weeks or, or next month, but we're looking at uh, one in four residents in the next month saying, you know, I'm facing serious problems. And then the month after that, we have another 15% who say they're facing serious problems. Um, so we're looking basically two months out before um, we have 40% of the population estimating that they're going to be, you know, really facing serious issues. That's just an incredible number. And I mean, I know it's hard to tell because this is also new and it's, it's been a matter of weeks, not months so far, but do you have any sense of whether people might get fatigued by all of this, by having to scrape money together, uh, to see money running out, to be following these social distancing guidelines, to be isolated? I mean, do you have a sense when people are going to start getting frustrated or maybe tuning out of, of all of the guidelines that they're supposed to be following? That's a that's the the million dollar question right there is <clears throat> because you know as the the Boston Globe also did a really interesting poll which I'd highly recommend people take a look at that was that that focused a lot on how unified people are right now and how they think that the measures that have been taken are largely the right ones. Um, our polling has found the same thing where almost nobody thinks that it's gone too far at this point. But you know when you roll the tape forward and you start to see these huge numbers of people that are you know, in serious financial distress, um, and you, and it's gone on for longer, and, you know, the adaptation measures that people put in place initially start to wear a little bit thin, you know, as, as homeschool drags into its second and third month, you know, and, uh, and you've walked every trail in your house, you know, you've done your 10,000 steps every day, it's like, that, that, can that unity persist? Or as problems start to stack up, both personal and financial, does that unity start to fray a little bit? Um, but at the moment, we don't really know. You know, this is something that has no um, probably solid precedent. Uh, but um, it's that we're we're facing in the next couple months a clash or or a, a collision between very strong, very impressive resolve uh, that met the Massachusetts residents are expressing right now and the problems that they're saying are coming their way. Right. Um, and I mean, we will see, I think, a bit of a confounding effect on that one uh, as well, where we've got your poll showed that 95% of people are following the news about the outbreak somewhat or very closely. But then you look at the kind of different messages you get that change by the day. For instance, President Trump initially saying that he wanted everything to open up by Easter, I think kind of arbitrarily, and then later after sustained pushback, amended, amended that saying that he was recommending everyone stay at home for longer. So it will be interesting to me to see if that unity about what the best approaches are holds steady across media platforms and from the messengers who are actually at the head of all of these different departments. So that's the other thing I'm gonna be keeping an eye on is, as the people in charge or those who are, for instance, highlighting economic impacts as kind of a macro issue, looking at the stock market, for instance, um, and they start to get more frustrated. Uh, I, I do worry about the idea of them pushing for maybe unsafe steps forward that, um, that doctors don't recommend, but we'll see. We'll see how that goes. We're, we're in the middle of it right now. Yeah, that's a great point, though, that, that, that uh, political leaders reacting to what their constituents 
how their constituents are feeling and that the pain they're expressing is another unknown that we have kind of coming up in the next few weeks or a month or so. Um, but anyway, that's that's a, a pretty quick look. We've got the results posted at massingpolling.com, and we also did a, a write-up for Commonwealth Magazine with a lot more results if you're interested. So definitely recommend taking a look if you want more on how residents are reacting to the situation. And now it's time to move on to the fun stuff. So this brings us to the end of the podcast. And last week we asked you, what is something that you wish you had in your Corona bunker that you don't? you know, the item that you forgot to buy and really wish you could run out and grab. And we got some pretty creative responses. Mine was actually Bisquick because I'm trying to only go to one store and I've been going to Trader Joe's and I don't like their pancake mix as much. Mm -hmm. Then I went to see if I could get it on Amazon and it was $42. So I don't have any Bisquick. Whoa. Excuse me? <laughs> Is I know. I, to, I need to call the AG about the Bisquick. Oh my goodness, it's, that, that, that is truly amazing. It, it is kind of astonishing the things that have run out and are just completely unavailable. Like ba any, anything related to baking seems like it's just gone. We can't get it. You know, oh yeah, I was, the trend that I've been fascinated by is the up down over the baking ingredients versus the products themselves. So for the first chunk of everyone quarantining at the market near us, no bread, like no bread products, but plenty of bread ingredients. And then everyone became a home baker. And suddenly there's tons of bread and no flour or yeast. So yeah. how's that working out at the, <clears throat> in your Corona bunker, not having access to bacon products? Oh, no. So the upside is because we're such a bake happy apartment here in the in the food sense, folks, because recreational marijuana is not an essential thing. <laughs> <laughs> Not essential. Uh, but not essential. No, medical is, which which is is good. Um, but I think I have actually been interested by the discourse over um, what has been declared an essential business versus a non-essential business. But marijuana notwithstanding, we have plenty of baking supplies in our apartment right now. So we had like fresh baked pizza last night, which is great. Like that's awesome. But I am worried we're going to run out of things. Yeah. Well, some other answers we got on Twitter uh, from our good friend, Jessica Puckett, who actually uh, was at Suffolk Downs for many years. She said a spin bike and or squat rack. Um, John Latino said it's self-control around food. Um, I need that one very badly. I oh, don't we? Uh, we gotta, gotta preserve the stores. Um, uh, uh, Twitter troll, Napoli Twitter troll extraordinaire, Stan Will Tarley said a racing simulator. I don't have any idea what that is about i don't i don't really know what that's for um like a video game like one of the ones you sit in and like put quarters in is that what we're talking about or maybe yeah. mario kart my order is much <laughs> light so i'll be playing mario kart soon oh yeah yeah i i feel like everyone's gonna get a lot more into video gaming like, not that it wasn't already a big thing, but I feel like everyone's going to start embracing the idea of multiplayer. Uh, but isn't there something called Animal Crossing that just had a big moment this week? Yes, uh, and my copy is coming in the mail. But a couple of other listeners who responded, Will, William Kamani said a Peloton bike in a rowing machine. Uh, Chris, job of the Chris, that's his handle on Twitter, said workout equipment. All of these healthy people... And then I think Grace uh, Nackwood summed it up and she said sanity. Oh, that would be so nice. A question for this week is what is a new hobby you've developed since you've entered the Corona bunker and have not come out yet? Um, so send us your answers on Twitter and we'll read them on next week's pod and you know, give you all the valuable rewards that you're, you've become accustomed to. But that's all of our time for today. Uh, so I'm Stephanie Murray, all of you cool cats and kittens. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Jennifer Smith. And I'm Steve Cazella, our producer who's not on screen is Libby Gormley telling us to wrap up. Um, don't forget to subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, great and review us online, please, as well, to help others find us. But for now, thank you all so much for listening slash watching, and we will see you next week. Adios. Bye.